I just spent a month and a half on the DL. For you non-sports fans, DL means disabled list. I had a bout with pneumonia and I'm in the process of recovering. And I would like to thank everyone for their best wishes, their kind thoughts, their cards, but especially for your prayers because they've worked. I thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to get back on the altar again, serving with Richard and Steve, for my brother Deacon Adrian, and our pastor, Father Michael. It's a real pleasure. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Gird your loins and light your lamps, and be like servants who await their master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds vigilant on his arrival. Amen, I say to you, he will gird himself, have the servants recline at table, and proceed to wait on them. And he should come in a second or third watch and find them prepared in this way. Blessed are those servants. Be sure of this. If a master of the house had known the hour when the thief was coming, he would not have left his home to be broken into. You also must be prepared, for at an hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Throughout his life, Jesus followed the Jewish form of greeting, which was customary at that time. Peace be with you. It was a way of saying, hello, how are you? After his death and resurrection, Jesus transformed this greeting into a gift, gift of serenity in the midst of this life's uncertainties. When Jesus greeted his disciples after his death and resurrection and said, Peace be with you, his words were an assurance that all was well. Jesus offered peace because he had won the victory over our twin enemies, that of sin and also death. Jesus offers us the same assurance that he gave to his disciples. He says in today's gospel, do not live in fear, little flock. And yet fear is a part of life. Franklin, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in his inaugural duress, on March the 4th, 1933, said to the American people, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The United States at that time was sunk in a deep economic depression, the likes of which we have not seen since. Wealthy businessmen were reduced to selling pencils on street corners. And women who had cherished their elaborate homes found themselves without a place to live. Despite the president's assuring words, many Americans thought they had very much to fear. What about each one of us? Does our faith 
in the words of Jesus, calm our fears. Not about the economy, but about the great issues of life and death. The letter to the Hebrews in the Mass of this Sunday tells us that faith is confident assurance concerning what we hope for and conviction about things we do not see. What is our faith about the faith future based on? What is the source of our conviction? In 1933, the past begot fear in the hearts of Americans. For us, the past should strengthen our faith. Think about the great ancestors of our faith. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob, and all the devout people of the Old Testament. They were seeking a homeland. They found it not primarily on this earth, but in heaven. They finally discovered that they had nothing to fear. Their destiny should fill us with confidence. When we look to the era when Jesus was on this earth, what do we see? We see that by dying, he destroyed our death, and by rising, he restored our life. We see that by his cross and resurrection, he has set us free. He is the Savior of the world. Our faith is based on the reality of all that God has done. First in the events of the Old Testament, and then in a very special way in the death and resurrection of his son. The only thing we have to fear is not fear itself, but a lack of faith. There is a story about a young naval ensign who expressed the admiration and love for his parents. The naval ensign's name was Neil Scott. He was son of a Presbyterian minister of Goldsboro, North Carolina. In 1940, he graduated with honors from Davison College. He then entered the Harvard School of Business Administration. When the Second World War broke out, he immediately enlisted in the Navy. He was on a ship, and then the Battle of the Solomon Islands, a Japanese suicide bomber hit the deck of Ensign Scott's ship. He was mortally wounded, and young Scott shouted to his mates, keep the guns firing. He then dictated a farewell message to his father with these last words, to have you as mother and father for these 24 years has been all I could ask for in this world. Your children will be able to say the same thing about you parents if you take to heart the words of Jesus in today's good news. Our Lord calls faithful and wise the steward who takes proper care of the servants in his charge. Today we rarely have the situation common in the time of Christ in which one person who is in charge a number of servants. How then do our Lord's words apply to us today? God has given fathers and mothers 
the charge of a certain number of children to train, to feed, to clothe, to direct, to correct, and be responsible for. Today's gospel is a warning to careless parents and an encouragement to conscientious moms and dads. Here are a few suggestions on how you can fulfill your trying, taxing job as a parent. Number one, learn to listen. Let your boy and girl state your case. Words like you're crazy or you're dumb shouldn't be in your vocabulary. Number two, be available. That is, save some moments when your boy and girl can talk with you. Start this at a very early age. The greatest inheritance a parent can give to their children is to spend each day offering a few minutes of your time. Number three, do things together. Make sacrifices to be interested in what interests your children and start a prayer life from Mary babyhood. Number four, praise your children sincerely but sensibly when they do something worthwhile. Number five, be informed. It is shocking how little some parents know about drug abuse, alcoholism, or premarital sex. If you don't know, find out. Take time to read or inquire. Your parish or public library, your pastor or your teachers may possibly help. And number six and finally, above all, show them and tell them a good example. Attend Mass, receive the sacraments, respect God's holy name, drink moderately, avoid quarreling, and your children will usually follow in your steps. For this tremendous superhuman job for moms and dads, you need superhuman help, the help that only Christ can give. To be a parent, you will, will be remembered as Father Ensign, Ensign Scott remembered his parents. You must make sacrifices. As we renew the sacrifice Christ on the altar today, we ask him to help you share in his sacrifice by your effort to be an intelligent and sacrificing, sacrificing parent.